Why don't we get started? We're very happy to have Steve Davis present. Uh, I love this green title, The Big Shift to Remote Work, uh, which is based on work with Nick Bloom, who's be here in a minute, and they are very old. So um, welcome. It's good to see you. Good to, you're here. It's, it's Thank good. you so much. Sure, it's great to be here. This is one of my favorite groups to talk to. Um, so uh, I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, here's an overview. Uh, I'll put a few facts on the table first, um, broad facts, and then I'm going to I'm going to skip number two because I've talked about it in this forum before at length, and basically I have a lot more evidence to support the points that I've made previously. So unless you guys want to get into, you know, what is it that drove this uh, rapid big shift, uh, I'll skip over that and get into the remaining items. Uh, we may or may not get through all of these. Um, they, they probably look like a disparate mix at this point, and that's partly by design, because one of the things that I hope you get a, you, you take away from this, um, this uh, presentation, this is, is that there's been an historic shift in working arrangements happened in a very short time, and it has implications, uh, societal and economic implications along many dimensions, some of which are obvious and some of which are subtle. So I'll get into several of them. Oh, here is, um, here's an effort uh, piecing together three different data sources, which are not exactly comparable, but this is our best effort to show what's happened to the extent of work from home uh, in the past 60 years or so. Uh, and the measure here is the percentage of full paid work days performed at home. So we're not trying to capture you the two hours of work in the evening after you commuted back home from the office. So these are full paid work days from home. Uh, the story here is one of um, relatively modest upward uh, drift in the extent of a work from home uh, before the pandemic. Uh, to something like 5% of full paid work days done from home or some other remote location uh, before the pandemic struck. And then by our measure, our survey of working arrangements and attitudes, but also by those of several other uh, research teams, the extent of work from home rose to over 50% uh, in spring of 2020. It's come down since then, but it's stabilized in recent months. So I'm going to now zoom in on the part of this chart that comes from the survey of working arrangements and attitudes. That's a survey we've been running monthly of American workers since uh, May, 2020. Uh, and here's what it looks like. So again, same metric, this is in the same measure, just zooming in now. And you can see not much has happened. It's fluctuated around 30%. Um, we're looking by the way at um, people who meet uh, a prior year earnings requirement of $10,000. So you know, the people who are working a few hours a week or part of the year in a fast food restaurant and so on, they're going to large, largely be outside of our frame. So think of these as something like people who are strongly attached to the workforce. Um, I didn't put it in the deck, but we also ask uh, workers in this survey, you know, what is, what is your employer plan for you to do in the future after we've kind of got the pandemic in the rearview mirror? And that is also now settled down to values that are very close to what you see here. So those are two pieces of evidence that lead me to think that we're starting to settle into something. I don't mean to say it's going to be exactly a steady state, but the big shifts are probably in the past. Now, I'm going to switch across data sources frequently in this seminar. If you've got questions about particular data sources, you know, just raise them. There's a bunch of information at the back of these slides about the various data sources. Um, Marie's going to make them available afterwards. This is now using Google workplace mobility deviations from pre-pandemic levels, which I suspect many of you are familiar with. The advantage of this measure is you can get it for um, most of the countries in the world, or at least uh, you know, most of the countries with a sizable economy. And what you see here is that uh, the extent of the shift to work from home in Canada and the United States is, is larger than in most other countries. And that's partly because they have highly educated workforces compared to most of the rest of the world. Um, that's not the full story, but that's a big part of it. So I'm just trying to put things in a, in a broad frame here. You should think of the, I'll mostly show you data for the US today. It is a global phenomenon. The phenomenon is highly concentrated among better educated people. Richer countries have larger shares of their workforce that are 
well-educated, college-educated and above. So when you think about how this extends to the rest of the world, uh, you should keep that in mind. Yes. For the, for the previous slide, do you have that disaggregated by level of education? I, I do, and I don't think I put it in the slide deck, but it's very sharply rising in education levels. And then what about gender and race? Um, conditional on education, not that much different across uh, gender and race. But of course, the occupation distribution, the educational distribution does differ quite a bit across race and, and, and that matters a fair bit. So, and this is related to the question you just asked me. So it's much more prevalent uh, in industries where there's higher shares of professional and knowledge workers. These are people who tend to be highly educated. Uh, this is days per week by major industry sector. You can see in the information sector, including kind of some of the high tech sector, finance, insurance, professional and business services. Uh, it's two days or more, two or two more days per week. That's the average in, 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 uh, in uh, recent months. And in sectors where most of activity either involves working with making stuff uh, with your hands or, or, or machines or running machines that are making stuff or face-to-face -face, uh, encounters with, with other people, the work from home rate is quite low. Um, there are big differences um, by population density. Okay, so this is again use, going back to the survey data. Now we pooled over many months to to be able to uh, get enough grant, uh, density in the data set to show you what the work from home rate looks like. Same metric as before: percentage of uh, full paid days work from home as a function of population density. We can do it by uh, zip code of the residents of the worker or zip code of their employer's location doesn't make a heck of a lot of difference. You see the same basic pattern um, that, you know, in the, in the highly dense areas, the densest part of the countries gets up close to 50%, but in much of the country, it's more like 20%. Now, this is the part I'm going to, I'm going to skip unless you really want me to uh, drill into it. I talked about all these things um, in this forum about a year ago. And as I said, I've got more data to back up these points, but basically no, no fundamentally new points to make. So what, what, what do you think is the most important reason is, is, is it's lasting? That, that, that it's lasting? I yeah. think it's the interaction of number one. We had a massive uh, coordinated experiment coupled with the green stuff at the bottom, which is a lot of things happened in the last, uh, in recent decades that made it feasible to shift a great deal of work activity to uh, remote locations without much loss of productivity. Okay, so, but there's there's cert that's certainly, you can see from the, this list, not the full story. Yeah, Ken. Steve, you, the slide you went through, you made some comments about density. Now, Brooklyn, New York, I presume is highly dense. LA is, it's not. This is a zip code in L. This is a particular zip code. Yeah. So what oh. we're doing here, is we're looking at things at the zip code level, then we're binning zip codes by density. So it's oh. not it's not LA as a whole. Okay. That's just okay. to show you that that happens to be okay. a zip code okay. that's in LA. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll show you a city graph later. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's not it. So yeah. What do you what do you make of this gradient? Because you might you might have expected the gradient to be flipped in terms of the <clears> sign that. The more remote I am, the more attractive it is for me not to want to come. Yeah, there's to there's a couple things going on here. The biggest one is again the education and occupation mix of the workforce. Dense areas have lots of highly educated knowledge and professional workers. I've already shown you those are the folks who uh, have have jobs that lend themselves to remote work. There's that's not the whole story. There's a couple of other things going on as well. People who live, who work in highly dense areas tend to have long, sometimes onerous commutes. They'd like to avoid that, okay? Yeah. I think it'd be interesting to see this residualized, having those things residualized out of it to see if- Yeah, we've done that. Traditional... It's not in my deck here. And, and you, can, you can take away much of this gradient, but not all of it with observables on workers, jobs. You, do, uh, you, can, you can roughly half, you're totally right. This seems initially really surprising. You can roughly half the gradient if you control for education, industry. I think, I mean, we were talking about this yesterday, industry and demographics. Yeah. Right. But you still, the other thing that's interesting is it's kind of hard to kill red-blue split. 
So if you look yeah. at and Democrat counties, whatever you control for the Democrat and this, you can see initially it has a huge correlation of work from home. Even if you control for everything, we can see it's still there. Yeah. I mean, there's a discussion about why, but it shows yeah. up. And it, was, it wasn't a critical point. It was just more a conceptual point, because I think normally for urban economists, when we think about space, we think that there's this kind of like rent distance gradient that's negative. And then this is like a positive gradient. And I think that that's super interesting as we think about what the future cities are going to look yeah, like. Um, <laughs> that's the last part of my talk, which oh, I probably won't <laughs> get to, but, 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 but you're quite right. And and I think partly for that reason, the, the unresidualized version of this has profound implications for cities. Of course, to understand the phenomenon, we want to see what's underlying it. But just in terms of direct consequences for cities and dense urban areas in general, you know, we just want to look at the raw patterns because that's telling us about commuting, potential out migration, and so on. John, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, the story of people move to their summer houses and move to the suburbs just isn't true. That um, yeah. are, most of the people who live in Lake Tahoe are in construction in Lake Tahoe, and there's just not that many tech workers who moved up there. Well, that, I think that's a bit of an overstatement. There's no. some of, there. there is, I'll show you some evidence. There has been some out-migration from the dense, literal, literal out-migration from the densest urban areas. And there's very clear uh, shifts in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the land value, residential land value gradient that came up earlier that are consistent with this notion that people want, are, are they're trying to spread out, okay? Um, uh, there, there's some, there's, there's lower quality evidence on the commercial real estate side that also kind of fits this story. So there is some of this, uh, there is a fair bit of that going on. Um, okay, so uh, anyway, I'm gonna skip this part of the talk um, and get to the benefits. Uh, that's the next section. So. Yeah, the, the, the most obvious benefit and perhaps the most important is just the time savings. Uh, when you work from home, you don't commute. There's also some time savings in, in grooming. Uh, that's, the, the, that's you know not surprising when you think about it. It's non-trivial. It's like 10 or 12 minutes a day. Um, I won't get into the details about you know shaving frequency, deodorant use and all that stuff, showering. That all we've actually asked about that, and and you know people do less of all that stuff when they don't go to the office. I think everybody here can agree that. <laughs> so anyway, um, these numbers are pretty big. So and these, these by the way, these are people who are actually on the margin. Uh, these these are people who uh, did it, did work remote at least some of the time during the pandemic. So this is not just you know some un, un, un uninteresting random sample. These are people who are on the margin. So it's more than 65 minutes a day. Uh, that's a big deal. Now, we kind of like to put this in, kind of like to aggregate in this in a way that is Can useful from a macro perspective. The size of the bars there, are you expecting a bigger difference by elementary middle uh, high? You know, I think that, that younger people, uh, yeah, I, I didn't have strong priors about that. Um, so, you know, I I suspect part of what underlies this is just uh, uh, your 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 ability to afford to live close to where you want to be. Thank you for the gender. Well, these are people with children for the most part, and you know most households with children have. Well, I don't know if that's actually true anymore. <laughs> to say, but um, there are some gender differences that I'll get I'll get to. Um, but I, I the, the main point of this chart is. You know, you're saving more than an hour a day when you don't commute on average. That that that's a big deal. Now, I want to put this in macroeconomic a macroeconomic way. So, um, this this is a this is if you can see the elements of here. This is a uh, basically the percentage of total time spent commuting or working uh, based on pre-pandemic um, work patterns. That's the denominator, and the numerator of this is is the time savings as a result of the shift uh, to more work from home after the pandemic, okay? I won't walk through the details of this, except to note, you can read the details as I talk here, but we have all, we, we measure all of these elements in on the right-hand side of equation one, except for the thing labeled work from home pre, uh, which is pretty easy to impute from other sources. That is the um, percentage of, of days worked from home 
or individual I uh, before the pandemic. So you, remember, first it was it was close to zero anyway for most people, and just based on education, occupation, industry, gender, age, all this stuff, you can go to external data sources and impute that. So we use an imputed number for that, but everything else in there is something we ask about directly in the SWAG. So and we do this at the individual level, and then we aggregate up. So uh, so I get well, when we do this, we get about the, the total time savings is 1.3 percent of pre-pandemic time spent working in community. When you do it on an earnings weighted basis, you get a number more like 1.7%. When you account for the grooming time savings as well, which is not explicitly in the formula because we didn't start asking the grooming time questions until, until later. So we don't actually have it for all of the, all of the individuals that feed into this formula. That, that gets you close to a number like 2% on an earnings weighted basis. So for the macroeconomists, in the room, you should think about this shift uh, to work from home uh, saved about 2% of earnings weighted hours. That's a huge deal in my view. Big, that, so that's a big benefit that you can quantify very directly, doesn't rely on a bunch of subjective stuff. Now, a footnote to that discussion is we, we've also asked Americans, those who say they, uh, um, you know, our community, uh, how much time or how, uh, how, the, how much time they save by working from home. This is the breakdown. The number that I'm going to make use of later is the top one. They, they take about 40% of their commuting time savings and apply it to work on their job. You believe okay. that? You, didn't, I, 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 you believe that? Yeah, I do believe that. I, mean, I have no reason not to believe it. You didn't ask them about working on another job. We have asked them about that, um, and just not in this chart. I think we might have combined the two in this. I don't remember actually, but we've asked yeah, them Steve, about that's, work. That's Go exactly ahead. right. That's exactly, that's so exactly that, yeah, right. So <laughs> it's mainly work on the primary job, but there's also a so I, I, those two are aggregated. Yeah. Do you ask questions about productivity? Are they? Are they do. They're coming. See, um, Chris, you, you in some sense you have a paper about the benefits of work from home. You also have a paper about the costs of zoning laws that stop people from living near where they work. We were wasting a lot of time on commuting. Yeah, and yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, we, we still have lots of laws on the books that make it a real, um, well, that, that, that raise tax costs and cause all kinds of compliance headaches for firms that want to have employees in more than one state because you can create a tax nexus just by having one employee in another state. And at a minimum, you have to you know, do all the new UI and workers compensation in the new state. So we still have many other laws on the books that are, that are inhibiting the full realization of remote work possibilities. As if you go talk to an employer that, that has had to deal with this, they'll give you an earful about what a headache it, what a headache it is. Okay. Now, I want to talk about the structure of preferences around work from home. So now I'm going to get into more subjective stuff. Um, so I've already shown you the kind of hard evidence that there are some time savings benefits. Um, there are many studies of which Nick is probably the leading producer. I shouldn't say there's many. There's a handful of excellent studies of which Nick is, uh, has, has you know, written one of the exemplars or more than one of the exemplars that um, kind of have field experiments to get at the willingness to pay for the option to work uh, uh, some or all of the time uh, from home. Um, th those studies are great. They're in the sense that they're very tightly identified, but they're typically for rather narrow slices of the workforce, like call center workers or, or um, uh, IT professionals or something like that. So what we did here, is we took a different approach because we wanted to get a broad cross section. And now I'm gonna draw on uh, a global version of the of the sway. So we've we've now rolled out two uh, international versions of of the survey of working arrangements and attitudes to 27 countries. Okay. So and the patterns I'm I'm going to describe here uh, hold across broadly across almost all of these countries. Okay. So <clears throat> we basically ask people, um, would you like you know what what would you be uh, willing to pay 
to work from home two or three days a week, or in some cases, you know, how much would you have to be paid to work from home two or three days a week? Because not everybody likes to work from home. Um, most people do, but not everybody does. Some people dislike it. Um, and so I'm gonna just show you the, the mean willingness to pay for the option to work from home two or three days a week is 5% of pay. And then what I'm gonna show you is the differentials around that. And I want you to, so I'm gonna talk about conditional means. The rest of the numbers in this table are conditional means. But I want you to keep in mind, well, I'll show you those and then I'll, I'll make the, the last point. So conditional on other observables like education, living arrangements, children, uh, commute time, all that kind of stuff. Um, women have a stronger preference to work from home uh, than men. Here is, it's about a 1% differential in their willingness to pay for the option to work from home two or three days a week. People with young children have a stronger uh, willingness to pay, about 1% of pay, and it's, it's equally true for men and women, okay? Um, perhaps that might be surprising. Uh, more educated people have a, a stronger willingness to pay, probably because they have nicer places to work at home. I'm not sure, but that's, that's certainly going to be part of it. People with longer commutes, not surprisingly, have a bit, uh, uh, stronger willingness to pay to work from home. To kind of put, help you think about what, what these numbers mean, I, I have an illustration that compares two hypothetical persons uh, using these, these regression-based numbers. So think about a married woman with a graduate degree children under 14 in a 45 minute one-way commute from say a suburban home and compare her to a single college educated male who lives five minutes from the office and walks to work. So just let me just finish this point out. The differential willingness to pay between those two people, uh, th that's the conditional mean again, is, is about 6% of pay. If I were to put age as one of my differentiators in there, I could make, I could drive this up even larger. So the point is, there, there are huge differences in the willingness to pay across observationally similar persons. The implication is people are going to sort across employers and within employers across the working arrangements they offer. That is, I think, likely to be a profoundly important social and economic development. It's going to take many years to play out fully, um, but you know, I don't think we've really wrestled, wrestled yet with what that means. Ivan, I'm going to make one, one more point, and then I'll take your question. Despite these patterns that I've emphasized in this chart, which show up you know, quite clearly across countries, the R square on a regression of willingness to pay on kind of the, the bucket of observable stuff is only like 13%. Mm -hmm. So what that says is there's a lot of heterogeneity in this willingness to pay, even conditional on all these observables. Uh, that's an important thing to keep in mind as well. I, Do you ask about looking after elderly parents? We do. Um, yeah, we often, it's often lumped in with our childcare responsibilities. Um, so yeah, people with childcare or other, other caregiving responsibilities do have a stronger desire to work from home as measured by this measure. And also when you just ask them, how often would you like to work from home ideally? Ken. No, pay here is, there's two parts of my question. One is pre-tax versus post-tax dollars. The other one is when you're asking them, um, are they holding it in the back of their minds? Are they holding fixed benefits um, like health care? I mean, what's. <clears throat> yeah, I think they probably are holding fixed. Yeah. The question doesn't specify that. Yeah. Um, I nor, nor does it clearly specify whether this is an after tax or pre tax. Mm -hmm. I interpret it as pre tax, but you're quite, you're quite right to hit on this issue. And I think, um, you know, one of the underappreciated Bennett, or another underappreciated aspect of this shift from work from home is the it clearly has big amenity values to, to most people, but it's an untaxed amenity value. Yeah. Okay. With, unlike other amenities, healthcare benefit. Well, healthcare no, <laughs> it's not, it actually is is tax preferred. But there are many benefits that 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 are taxed. So this so so this this tax aspect of it cuts very differently across different people because of the income tax yeah, bracket. Commuting costs are not tax deductible typically. Yes, yeah. And yeah so, no, that's a good, that's right. So yeah, I think I think this is, a, we, we make this point, we haven't really, yeah. you know, yeah. fleshed out all the implications. See, yeah. this is fascinating. I just wanted to ask to repeat, how's the question framed? Is it sort of an open-ended, how much would you be willing to pay? Can they put in a dollar figure? No, so it starts out with, you know, first, um, would 
I'm trying to remember. It's a, we, most of we always take kind of a we've asked this kind of question many different ways. I'm struggling to remember exactly what this two, the it's frame too is. Far. It's, it's people, always two parts. Amazingly, yeah. people come up here with negative numbers. Like oh what, yes, I think because everyone's <laughs> used to negative numbers in Excel being like brackets. So you have to. We initially used to say like so you have to say would the the option to work from home two three days a week be good neutral or bad? Yes. Now they Thank say you. neutral, we move on. We do the zero. Now they say good or bad. We say roughly how much, something like this, roughly how much the percent of pay, and we give like six boxes from zero to yeah. one yeah, to two percent, three to five, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah we've learned yeah. by painful experience that you, you've got to you've got to take this two part approach. Okay. Uh, and then you've got to, as Nick said, don't don't ask them to give negative numbers. You can't. The number of they, tests just, we did. I remember, I remember Oscar. That guy, anyway, they just do not get negative numbers. So he just, for economists. Well, or worse yet, some of them do and some of them don't. So then yes. you've got a mix of some. Yeah. So yeah, we've learned, there's a lot of small tricks of the trade we've learned in the past few years. Maybe Nick knew some of them already, um, but certainly I did, I've i learned. Okay, so yeah, please go, go ahead. Um, we've seen, I think that folks who are just starting off in the labor force um, in during the uh, pandemic, show lower job satisfaction. Um, and one uh, thought there is that perhaps working from home just as you're getting into a new job is um, not what you really want. Um, is that something that you can do? Um, We've asked about that. And so two things on that. If you act, there's clear evidence that there's a greater concern for uh, the importance of being president, present uh, for mentoring and so on among the younger people. So that's consistent with what you're saying. On the other hand, the majority of them don't seem concerned about it at all, even the younger people. So there, there's two sides to this. Um, so so I, it seems to me like they're under concern, but that's maybe a value judgment on my part. Uh, when I talk to managers, they certainly think that the young people in their organizations do not fully understand the benefits of personal interactions. Mm. So what we, if you were to ask that valuation question, no difference between younger workers and older workers. There, no, there is there is a difference. There is a difference. So so it's very clear as as you kind of move up the age scale, people are less and less concerned about what they might lose out on by not being present. So when you get to people of my age, they're not worried about it at all. They've already got their networks, they, they've got their established presence. So the gradient that you expected is there. It's just that the level, the level is doesn't seem quite right for the young folks. <clears throat> okay, so what if what do people like about working from home? Well, we've kind of hinted at this already, but we ask this directly. The biggest one is you know no commute, but there's all they also value the, the other forms of time saving, time flexi flexibility, fewer meetings, uh, uh, and so on. They also like things about the work site. Um, they like the face to face collaboration. Mm -hmm. the, some people like maintaining work, personal life boundaries, mm. you know, and all this stuff. <clears throat> Quiet and in, 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 in interestingly shows up in both charts. Mm -hmm. Some people you know, can have a quiet space to work at home and some people can't. So, so not surprisingly in light of this, you know, one of the, a lot of people are settling in and a lot of organizations are settling into allowing a considerable amount of hybrid work where people are sometimes working on site and sometimes working remotely. Um, now, <clears throat> when you when you look at the intersection, who wants to work from home, how much they value working from home, and who gets to work from home in terms of what their employer has told mm -hmm. them will be their long-term working arrangement, you get the red the, the chart there in the, the box in red. So that is our estimate of the value of what their employer, so let me, let me be clear about this. So we're, we're taking the individual's self-assessed willingness to pay to work from home, but we are then intersecting that with what their employer has told them about how much they'll actually get to work from home. So we're taking both those pieces of information into account. That's how you get the, the red rectangle here. And they, there's two key points here. All across the earnings distribution, there are on average benefits, direct benefits to the increased shift to work from home, but there's a very strong earnings gradient there. There's also a very strong education gradient. 
So it's well-educated, high-earning professionals is the prototype of people who are really getting large amenity value gains coming from the shift to work from home. And when you look, when you kind of move down the income scale, those things get smaller and smaller, they're still positive jobs. Steve, given the huge heterogeneity, this is adding up all the individuals as opposed to the bin bucket average. Okay. This is, yeah, we've aggregated up from the individual level here. So we have individual data on what your employer has told you about how many days per week you will work once the pandemic's but, over. And also what it's worth to me, because I was gonna say on your, on your previous, which was the average, the, given the heterogeneity, the interesting, I'd also- There's a COVID. Quantum, how many people are there in the top 10%? Are those people willing to you know, have twice, is it worth twice their, uh, their wages to do it? Well, you can see- you said there's people a, are gonna Yes, there's a little, the, it's not highlighted there, but the, the right, the right uh, set of columns is just the mean value of the option to work from home three days a week, aggregating up the people in those groups. And you can see that's that's pretty steeply rising too. It's not, it's not the sum of, it should be the sum of all the individual values. It's the, it's the I'm not sure why you say the sum. It's the, it's the average across persons of people in the group of the percent willingness to pay. That's what's, <laughs> that's what's in the rightmost column. The leftmost column is doing the cap, the cross product at the individual level, then aggregating, which I which I thought was getting at what you were asking me about, because there could be a an interesting covariance here, and there is actually. Yes. What's interesting is if you divide the right by the center, it seems that the less you earn, the less likely the employer is being nice to you. Yeah, well, that's one way to look at it, but I, but kind of a, 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 another way to say it is that the people, the people who don't, employers more likely to be nice to you. Well, there, there's some of that, but the bigger deal is the people who earn less just work in jobs that don't lend themselves to remote work. They're they're the ones doing face to face customer contact or working in the meat packing plant or something like that. want to. They all want it. That's the interesting. If you just ask people what would be your optimal arrangement, it's pretty flat across the whole earnings distribution. <laughs> But not everybody's going to get what they want, you know. And maybe it's because of bargaining power issues, which you're suggesting. But I think it's mainly just the nature of the jobs are different. Okay, let me. I want to push it. So I'm collecting Steve, several points. Steve, one second. Yes. If, you, if you go back to that slide, if you look at uh, the actual dollars involved, the ratio is stupendous. People are, these the are ratio, big numbers. Yes, these are big I numbers. Mean, you know, Eleven thousand dollars versus a few hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah the, the the numbers are very large. The numbers yeah. are very large, yeah, and the they have. Yeah, the yeah. absolute dollar amounts are just stupendously steep. And yeah, uh, basically, what you're saying is, in some sense, COVID and all that, all that reexamination, etc., has unleashed. Um, a lot of value for writ for high earning, highly educated people. So then the question was, why weren't those people able to negotiate something like this beforehand? Well, that's the part of the talk I skipped over. Okay, okay. Um, so I, I'm. Why don't we talk about that one offline? Because I could spend twenty minutes on that. Um, but many people okay, in this no. room have heard that talk already. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, so I'm, I, I'd rather push ahead. Okay, um, okay. But it is a fascinating question, and that's why early, you know, the first 18 months of this research program was very much aimed at, at trying to address that question. We think we have a pretty good answer right now. So this collecting several points. First, this is my, my another way to make my point. There are large direct benefits on average for workers and, and families coming from the, the time savings, the greater flexibility, the greater personal autonomy, and so on. These benefits flow mainly to the college educated people who are a larger share in richer countries, and, but not everybody benefits. Okay, you can, it's not too hard to find people who are disadvantaged. Um, I didn't show you the data, but people who live in cramped living quarters uh, don't like working from home much. People have lousy internet connections are highly unproductive when working from home, so they don't like it either or they can't do it effectively. Um, the young are losing out on uh, potentially on some networking and learning opportunities. And then there can be equilibrium effects, which we, we, which we may get into towards the end of the talk, that are probably you know, fall mainly on the immobile urban poor, 
who could be hurt by the exodus of jobs from the uh, urban, urban centers and from a deterioration of local public goods. Okay, so you know, there are definitely some losers. All right, so I want to try out this. I haven't, this is a fairly new line of argument. John, I'm especially curious to hear what both Johns think about this because you guys worry a lot about inflation and stuff. So um, and there's an interesting uh, effect, we think, of the shift to work from home on wage growth. So let me uh, make the theoretical argument and then show you some evidence. So let's start out. I'm just going to summarize things we've already said, but couch them more as a theoretical argument. The big shift to work from home raised the amenity value of employment. I've established that, I think, and so have many others. So I think that's like completely uncontroversial. Point two is also completely uncontroversial. I think it's kind of obvious. The amenity, the amenity value shock came as a surprise. And nobody in early February was expect, early February 2020 was expecting this. It was a complete, complete shock. So what that means is that initially at given wages, workers reap the full value of the amenity value shock. Okay. So, but that's really not where we expect things to end up in equilibrium. Uh, because we expect over time that compensation will adjust to share those amenity value gains between uh, employers and workers and maybe with customers and other stakeholders as well. So it's that, it's that adjustment process, that transition process, will, as that's going on, wage growth pressures will moderate. That implication follows immediately in a, say, a Nash type bargaining model where, you know, uh, Conventional Nash model would say, well, half of the amenity value gains go to workers, half go to employers. Um, but it also holds in a competitive model, a very different model for, for different reasons. You know, it's a, it's a shift in the labor supply curve um, that leads, you know, because now the job at, at a given um, pecuniary compensation, the job is now more attractive if you can do it uh, from home two or three days a week. So that's like an outward shift in the labor supply schedule even if you're of the view that labor supply is inelastic, remember I showed you some evidence that people are taking part of their commute time savings and devoting it to work on the job. So even in the world, if, even if you're of the view, which, which I guess maybe some labor economists are, I'm not sure if that's still the case, that labor supply is quite inelastic, you would still expect to get um, an effective shift in the labor supply curve that leads to a reduction uh, in the wage. Now, Why are people working, spending, taking the, some of that saved time and then spending it on more work time? I mean, if somebody has an eight hour, a, a, you know, 40 hour week well, job. Why do you work? Why, why don't you just supply zero effort to your job? Because you think on the margin, you know, there's there's a reward to you, or maybe you're just a good guy. Uh, that's yeah, that's mean, your case, Ken. Yeah, but, well, but, but, you know, people are adjusting. The, the, I mean, it's, I don't think we, don't, we normally don't think of workers as being you know, engaged in charity. No, they're not engaged in charity. Well, but, but, you know, why are they working harder than that? Why are they sweating at the office? Because they want to impress the boss. Well, a lot of people were worried, especially early in the pandemic, about losing their job. And they were yeah. trying to show that I can do well, this yeah, from home. I can do this from the, home. That's part of the shock. That's part of the temporary React. If you want to continue working from home and you're not sure whether your boss will let you work okay. from home, then you should show your boss you can be productive working from home. One way to do that is to take some of your time. So there's, there's another part of the compensation schedule. In this, in this then. Yeah, yeah. So the, look, this, okay, that's... The, the, let, let me say two things. The, this is a, this is, I think, a sensible theoretical argument. Yeah. What's not here, but which we are working on is let's write down an explicit model. Yeah, yeah. Preferences task yeah, allocation, yeah. time allocation decision. That, that is coming soon in the next version of yeah. our paper on why working from home will shift. For now, I'm just trying to give you a, qual a set of qualitative arguments that's gonna set up the empirical evidence I'm gonna show you. I, I find these qualitative arguments pretty persuasive, but I agree with you. We want a structural economic model here. John. I would, I would try a different uh, argument. We just reflect different elasticities of curves. So, so we get a, we get a free hour a day, which we use to, you know, half of it to help our bosses or whatever, with apparently not much productivity per hour going on. So I would think that um, what would happen is that earnings, wages stay the same, earnings go up, and uh, industry expands because now you can do more with fewer workers. Um, yeah, it's not sure. It's, it's empirically, it's hard to 
make fine distinctions between earnings and hourly wages for many workers. So it's, it's but you might be right. Uh, we are, I don't, I don't have anything refined enough to speak to that point at this point. We are, I'm gonna show you some evidence that these forces are in play and you're gonna see that the evidence is kind of, it's quantitative evidence, but it's directional in nature. We are engaged in an effort now to try to really go things like the CPS, which at least for some people will allow us to distinguish earnings and, and hourly wages and so on. But I, I don't, I'm not really in a position to make such fine distinctions right now. Yeah. yeah. I'm thinking about Ken's question. One of the things that it might be useful to, to contemplate in this framework is the role of technology. So a lot of people become better at using the technology over time. And then secondly, the social cues for leaving changes, right? So if you coordinated in the office to leave at the same time as your neighbor, or you saw her leaving, then you say, oh, it's five o'clock, I need to leave. Now you're at home and you don't have as much of a track of, of that, right? And you might be able to separate that out. Um, yeah, well, on, you, those are two very different points you made. On the first yeah. one, the, the structural model that I alluded to earlier, has 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 an element of that exactly that we're going to think of the comparison between pre and post pandemic as an exogenous shift in the relative productivity of remote work, and then we want to figure out you know how that feeds through. So, Mike Mike Boskin I think asked me earlier the question, well, how did this come about? And I I kind of skipped over that. So that that will be there. The second part of your the second part of what you said is. Um, <laughs> would require data of a more detailed and granular nature than we currently have to get at. Because we aren't seeing who exactly what time somebody works and whether they're leaving the, uh, the work site at the same time as others or whether they're signing off for their computers at the same time as others. So I, 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 I don't have any evidence to offer. It's interesting on the second point, I've seen traffic flow. So unsurprisingly, mm -hmm. it's way down on Monday, Friday. But it's not like a three phase mm -hmm. rather than a two yeah. phase. It's not like Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Friday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The other thing that's interesting is on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the morning rush has spread out and the evening rush has still relatively compact. It's not obvious why, but one story is mm. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, people don't have a meeting in the office till 10. It used to be still going at nine because otherwise your boss would think you're, you're shirking. But now you got a meeting at 10, you just <laughs> leave at 9.30 because you work from home. Mm. So, But why they still leave at the same time is, it's, it was almost the reverse, which is quite odd. So people drift in. So you see, the other thing that's hilarious that we looked at also trips to golf courses, which is uh, <laughs> way up on Monday and Fridays and somewhat up in the weekday. But you know, it's like, you can see the Saturday, the second most popular day for golf courses is now Friday and the third is Monday and the fourth is Sunday. So the more people playing golf. You know, That's why I can't get a hold of Nick on Friday. Yes. <laughs> I don't play golf. It's like, I don't play golf. I think one way that you could get a, a traction on the, the culture piece is you could look at heterogeneity by the different types of Occupation. So there are some occupations where production is a lot more social, mm -hmm. it's a lot more centralized. And if you see in the time you see that those are the people who are more likely to get back time, then you could that would be suggestive evidence that that's what's going on. Yeah. No, it's it's a good set of questions. I just I, I just don't have much to say. I mean, Nick already gave much more insight than I had. Look at by age. That's your own, both Peter and Ken's question. You think people younger maybe are more focused on their career and willing to put in extra hours? Maybe I don't know. It's like um. John Vickers had that very old paper from the 90s and why CEOs get really high bonuses because they have less career concerns and more immediate pay. When you're in your 20s, you're very focused. Your bigger payoff is your career and less about your bonus rate, which would have some implications. Nick, one factual point. In the United States, very few golf courses are open on Mondays. Not anymore. It soon will be. They are now, yeah. Right, let, me, let me push it in. Let me push it in. So, so I want to get some, I want to put some evidence on the very data. Good. So we we have generated. asked for we have asked firms um, several times in the past year, uh, actually the past six or seven months, um, variants of, of the following questions. First, um, over the next twelve months, will your firm let employees work from home or other remote location at least one day per week to restrain wage growth pressures? About forty percent of them say yes. If you, we also ask backward looking versions of the same question. Again, about 40% of them say yes. Uh, in other words, they are potentially using expanded remote work opportunities as a way to moderate wage growth pressures. If they say yes, we then follow up with quantitative questions about how much 
OK, I'm then what I'm showing you on this table is just aggregating over all the firms, those that say they're not using it to restrain wage growth and those that say they are. And then how much the bottom line numbers are on the right column and what it suggests. And this is this is combining the backward looking and forward looking pieces. So think of this as the cumulative extent of wage growth moderation over a 24 month period centered at spring of 2022, it's about two percentage points, okay? So that's, that's interesting for a few reasons. First, it says some of this return of the amenity value shock to employers is in the process of happening, okay? Second, it speaks to you know, concerns that many people have voiced about um, monetary policy and the potential for um, wage catch up to feed into inflationary pressures going forward. So I think Olivier Blanchard has been perhaps the most visible proponent of the idea that because the inflation was a big surprise, workers experienced a big real wage cut. You can see that in the data very clearly, and they're gonna wanna get that back. And so our point is, well, they're not gonna wanna get it all back. They're not wanna, they, they, won't, they won't in equilibrium get as much back as you might think, because at the same time as a wage catch up, a real wage catch up phenomenon might be going on, this other transition uh, phenomenon is in play that moderates the, the real wage catch up effect. And, you know, these are, these are not trivial numbers when you're talking about uh, concerns about wage cost, wage, wage price uh, spirals in the inflation process. Let me pause here because I'm just curious to see what. You know, those of you who think carefully about inflation make of this argument and evidence. Wait, why is it 3.0? Why is it more educational argument? Oh, those are people where they there's more scope for remote work. So uh, the argument that I gave earlier would, would lead you to expect, um, you know, bigger, well, the education was not so clear as the fire professional services and so on. Can you separate ed out education? We... We don't have enough data to do it here, but we since I put together this chart, we've gone back to the field and almost doubled our sample. So the next version of the paper, we're gonna try to get finer industry gradations. But what, what we also will be doing is go to the CPS and look at these things on the CPS from the worker side. John. Well, I'm, I'm trying to you know, be the devil's advocate here. Every other technical advance winds up in, in the pockets of the workers. Uh, and this, this is just like a productivity and it's an increasing productivity shock. You can get you know, uh, that much more out of the same number of workers. So uh, why would this one wind up in the pockets of employers, not workers? I'm not, I'm not sure that's, the other way, that, this is not a normal, this is not a product, this, this, is, this is not a productivity shock. That's a different, an amenity value shock is a different beast. Okay, so that, that's part of the answer. But in general, if I just, if I just, Think about a competitive labor supply market with, you know, labor demand schedule driven by Cobb Douglas production function and a conventional upward sloping labor supply schedule that I should get sharing, which is what I, which is what these data suggest, sharing of the amenity value shock, which is what these data suggest. Um, now I haven't thought my way through, but, but it is, I do want to stick, this is not a productivity shock. There, there's a productivity shock aspect you know, going on as well, but this is a distinct beast. Well, it is in the sense that we save the commuting, these people are now working during the time they used to be commuting. So the same worker is now giving you uh, nine eighths as much work as, as used to. Yeah, that, that's part of it, but also you know, the commuting time, the commuting experience may be unpleasant. Mm -hmm. There's other things you get. So that there's an amenity value shock, which I don't think feeds into just, it's not just like a TFP shock. But my part was just there is a TFP shock. There, there's a TFP element to it too. So I, you know, what your comments and questions are pointing out is again something that came up really. We really need to write down a full structural model and tease all this out. And we haven't done that yet, but that is coming. So the other part is there's a shift, of course, between so places that can offer it, get that, but then so, oh yeah, oh yeah, but, uh, and and people are going to sort and yes. just, you know with the wage pressure is I I'm, what, why are they responding to wage why are they doing this response because people are threatening to go away and if they're willing to go away to somewhere that doesn't offer work from home then yes yes so there, so that that's that's another reason why 
this was on my earlier chart, I didn't say in words, this process will play out slowly, not just because of the usual slow wage adjustment right. reasons, but because employment relationships change as well to exploit what's going on here. And that will be a slow working and process. People, but that, that also means you don't immediately go from the experience of the place that can offer work from home to the average. Exactly. The average is going to include all the places that can't offer it. Yes, yes. And, and the pr whole process will take, the, you know, if employers want to say, let's get rid of my IT team in San Francisco, IT team in San Francisco and outsource it to people living in cheaper places and pay them lower wages. That's part of what's going on here. That's not going to happen overnight. So uh, let's see, I, I'm, I've got more good stuff for you. So let's see if I can push ahead. Um, this is just, you know, follow-up questions to ask. Is there something else that could be going on as a function of remote work that would offset these, um, these, wage growth moderation effects for employers. And I think this chart basically says no. The other things that are associated with the shift to remote work are also probably say, uh, labor cost savings. That's the, that's the main thrust of this, of this table. So the, the part-time work, I mean, one thing that work from home ought to do is, is make part-time work much more attractive because you don't have the fixed cost of having to go to the office. That's what these data say. I'm sorry, so I was trying to, but your word said that it wasn't a big deal. So, no, no, no. I, 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 I'm not being clear enough. Then, I'm trying to say that the other patterns that are associated with the shift to remote work are not counteracting what I just showed you in the previous slide. That's what I'm trying to say. You're making a different point now here, which I agree with, and which is very much supported by these data. Okay, now I get the, the graph says all the other wonderful things that are happening. Yes, okay. Well, see, they may or may not be wonderful, but they're happening. And uh, they did, when I look at what's happening, I don't see any reason to revise my previous view based on the previous chart table that um, uh, the shift to remote work is somehow, uh, <clears throat> I started, I showed you evidence back here that the amenity value shocks being shared partly with employers and that's that, as a result is moderating wage growth pressures. Of course, wages are not the only thing that feeds into labor costs. Now I'm trying to show you that when I look at other things that might influence labor costs, I don't see much evidence here that this would, there have been some increases in labor costs, non-wage labor costs that would cause me to revise my view. Ivan. In the longer term, you might add a question about whether they change their management practices. So flatter management or more hierarchical, some some of the old guys in business think that yeah. all these people require more supervision because they're yeah. not in the office. Yeah, they, they, I fully agreed. That's good. We that that's a harder thing to get around. So I I don't have sharp evidence to bring to bear on that right now. So I'm not going to say anything. I want to point out that there's that there's an there's a very interesting phenomenon that's happened since the early in the pandemic that outdoor in Dubai. I've seen them present this. Uh, they're the ones who alerted me to this. You're all aware that the wage distribution has been sp largely spreading out for decades. I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but you know, wage inequality is up and up. Well, just the opposite has happened in the past uh, two now, uh, two and a half years. Uh, just to give you the bottom line, the 90-10 wage differential, uh, according to Outdoor and Dubai, shrank by 10 percentage points from the first quarter of 2020 to the first quarter of 2022. That's enormous. Mm -hmm. And it's completely contrary to the kind of trends we've had back since the early 1980s. Now, so that kind of said, well, where's this coming from? Well, notice that we think, based on the evidence I just showed you in the argument, it's coming partly from uh, the amenity value shock, which as we discussed already, is very sharply rising uh, with earnings. So if, and just to give you some numbers here, um, these are numbers from the tables I've shown you earlier. The high-low differential uh, in that earnings gradient I showed you earlier, that's the amenity value of the big shift to work from home, is 5.8 percentage points, 5.8% of earnings. If that gets shared in a Nash bargain sense, half by workers and half by employers, then ultimately I would expect that to shrink the high-low earnings differential by 2.9 percentage points which is a big deal too. It's not 10, it's not the 10. And I realize I'm not doing exactly an apples to apples comparison here. So we think that there's part of what, not, not the whole story, but part of what is driving an extraordinary wage compression since early in the pandemic is 
the uneven incidence of this shift to remote work. Okay, good or bad for productivity? Uh, often the first question on the minds of macroeconomists. So I'm gonna come at this a couple ways, uh, by no means the only ways you could come at this. Um, one way is ask managers what they think is happening in their own firm or what or would happen if everybody came back to work on the business premises. So we fielded these questions quite recently in the survey business uncertainty. This is the Atlanta Fed fields this. Nick and I helped design this survey and instigated it. Uh, it's been running for nearly a decade now. So <clears throat> a plurality of, and so what, this is a survey that asks senior business executives questions about their own firm, something they presumably know a lot about. So a plurality of these uh, senior business executives think that if they could somehow magically bring all their employees back to work on site five days a week, it would have little or no effect on productivity. The balance of the rest think that productivity would go up. So that's consistent with the view that the shift to work from home has had some negative productivity effects, at least as perceived by managers. Now, if they're in the better or worse category, we have second stage question where we get ask them to give a number. And we're again, not asking them to give negative numbers for the reasons Nick explained earlier. So we frame the question differently depending on whether you are in the better or worse bucket. And then we, we have all these firm level outcomes and then we aggregate again. And I'm just gonna focus on the rightmost column. The bottom line here is according to managers assessments, the, there's been about a 1% productivity loss associated with the fact that we, don't, we no longer have people working from, from, the, from business premises pretty much all the time. This is, by the way, full-time workers, I think. So and that one, that one percentage point loss is pretty, pretty similar by size class and across industry sectors, okay? And here I'm integrating over all firms and I'm also accounting for the fraction of the firm's workforce that is actually working remotely, okay? So all of that is integrated into this analysis. We've got firm level data and all that stuff and then we aggregate it up. So there does appear, according to these data, at least a small negative productivity hit associated with working remotely. Kim. Um, you ask managers, um, why not ask the people who actually use the, um, the, the labor supply? I, uh, um, for example, here at Hoover, we now have this three day a week on-site business. Um, and it's been a bad negative productivity shock to me, basically. I now have to end up doing stuff myself that I used to have assistance from um, assistants. But, okay, well, uh, but so well, presumably you've communicated that to senior management. No, 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 senior management has never asked me and <laughs> it's pointless to, to tell Ken, them. knowing you, I find it hard to believe you've never expressed <laughs> oh, no. to senior no, management. No. I have, and it was pointless, okay? Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that's different. And, and, that, and the thing is that I don't know why managers elsewhere are any more responsive no, no. to these things. Yeah. So, so I, I, look, I get the point, but I, yeah. I am I am nonetheless happy with the premise that the senior managers of these organizations have some visibility into the organization. It may be imperfect. It's probably, it's certainly better than anybody else's visibility. I'm just saying, into ask the, the people on, who's got boots well, on the ground. Well, when Not we look at the, the smallest, no, but Ken, look, look, we do have a fair number of small businesses in yeah. here where this, where this, communication hierarchy problem you're describing is much less severe. Yeah. And you get, a, you get a very similar answer. So it doesn't look like that's somehow causing a big problem for us. The, the second row in the table is yeah. uh, firms with fewer than 50 employees. Yeah, and, those... and you get a one point, there it's 1.3 percentage points instead of one. So yeah, it's a little bit higher. Yeah. It's a little bit higher, sure. But, yeah. but my overall point is there yeah. isn't really affected by that. Difference, yeah. If a firm with say 50 employees and one person's working from home, the CEO is answering for that one person. Are you aggregating for the four? No, that, that's in going from the uh, yes, we are. So the there the mean there's a column there labeled in the middle, mean productivity loss among those who actually work work from home one day per week. That's three and a half percent. That's a bigger number. Yeah. But then when we account for the how what shares actually working from home, that's how we get to the one percentage yeah. point number. 
Okay. Now, what do workers think? So we did, we haven't asked the kind of mid-level managers that Ken wants me to ask, but but we have asked workers directly their own perceptions. So if you ask workers, yeah. um, so you can ask your own workers, Ken, um, <laughs> they think they're more productive by about 3% on average. So there's a gap between worker and employer. I'm not perception. allowed to ask questions like that of my workers. Okay, let, let me, well, you can take our survey and, and give it to them, but let me, let me continue. But when you drill down on the worker side and you, and you ask them, and we, we always, so we ask them if they say they're more productive working remotely, we then ask them, well, how much of that extra productivity you attribute to work, work from home is the time savings from commute? And that's about two thirds of the total that they give. Okay, and so that's very close to the 2% the number I got by a completely different method earlier. So if you take, if you kind of net out the time savings, the commuting time savings, then you get like a 1% positive on the worker side, the worker's perception. That's not that different from the manager's perception. Okay, so there's a, there's a, there's a misperception, there's a perception difference here, but all in all, it's pretty small. The bottom line I want you to take away from this, all this discussion of productivity is probably not a big level productivity shift. Uh, we haven't got to innovation yet, but the level productivity shift, shift looks pretty modest. Certainly more modest than the willingness to pay numbers we were looking at earlier. So what about the pace of innovation? Here I'm going to give you um, a series of arguments, which I very much would like you to respond to. The evidentiary foundation of what I'm going to say in this section is weaker than what I've said before, simply because evidence is scarcer. There's some evidence, which which I will pull out if you kind of push me, but I'm just going to I'm just going to start with kind of a bunch of high level observations. So the first one is extremely well established, which is throughout most of human history, uh, invention, innovation, entrepreneurship, artistic flowering, and so on has been highly concentrated in dense urban areas. Okay. So, and then lots of people, I won't name names, <laughs> lots of people look at that and say, wow, if we start spreading out our work activity, that's probably going to be detrimental to uh, the pace of innovation because uh, we'll get less in the way of agglomeration spillovers, benefits, and so on. That is a very widely held view among, particularly among urban economists, I would say, but, but, but not just urban economists. I'm not persuaded by that view and I'm more optimistic and let me tell you why. So I'm gonna go through a series of points and again, if any of them seem to you like they're doubtful, please, please object. First one is just a kind of a pretty simple observation, but one important to get on the table. Um, many highly innovative firms have operated across multiple cities and countries for a long time. So just as a starting point, it can't be that workforce dispersal per se is the killer of innovation and productivity growth. Okay, that, that just can't be the arguments. I wanna just dispense with that one. Point two is something you're all aware of, but it's worth articulating it. There are you know, key developments that facilitated the big shift to work from home that we talked about earlier, and here I'm gonna name them, the rise of the internet, better broadband, better video technologies, the emergence of the cloud, the expansion of uh, remote collaboration technologies, though all of those things created greater reach and higher quality in communication and collaboration at a distance. That's been going on at a particularly uh, rapid pace since the pandemic, but also in the previous 20 years or so, and which that differentiates it from most of human history. I didn't show you this, but the big, but there, but we have evidence that the big shift itself it has also stimulated further advances in technologies that uh, facilitate productive interactions at a distance. Um, the clearest evidence we have yet on that point is if you look at the composition of new newly filed patent applications. And so Nick and I have done with this with Yulia Jeskova, um, who's now at Goldman Sachs. Uh, what we did is a very simple exercise. We got, we downloaded the text of all uh, patent applications that were filed in like the last 25 years or so, however far back we could go. And we wrote simple programs to read in an automated manner, the descriptions of the technologies in those patents. And we classified those that do something to facilitate uh, audiovisual communication at a distance, managing people remotely, and so on. If you, I actually have the chart back here. I should just, I'm, uh, 
I skipped over this stuff, and I'm going to show you this one chart. Apologies for the. There's the chart. So that that red bar is the right before the start of the pandemic. You can see this is going along at about these these patents that kind of fit our classification of technologies that support remote work. It's going along at about half a percent of all patents, newly filed patent, these patent applications per year, and then the pandemic hits. And what happens? It's it, it begins rising and now it's at about twice the pre-pandemic level. Not really surprising to an economist when you think about this. If the if the market for remote work technologies grows by a factor of five, then all of a sudden you see more innovation that tries to serve that market. That's playing out. The point I want to make here is this suggests that the pace of improvements in technologies that allow for collaboration at a distance is likely to be more rapid going forward than it was before the pandemic. So all this stuff that we're doing, Zoom and so on, is going to get better and better and probably more rapidly than it did before. So that's the, the next point. I just want to get another point in favor of your thesis. We, okay. and we've seen this before. So the the streetcar, the uh, subway, and then the automobile and freeway let people disagglomerate, but then maintain their ability to come back <clears throat> and have the important work agglomerations. And now what we've yep. just done is basically the same thing. They can disagglomerate and still talk to each other. Yes. Uh, so it's yes. this history of you have to be in the same mm -hmm. place to, to work together is actually not true in the 20th century, which is like the biggest. Thank you, John. That's a that's a very I, I like that a lot. I'm gonna I'm gonna adopt that. And, and, but it's yours. But <laughs> but the way the way I said it, which is much more abstract and less 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 maybe less compelling than the way you say it, is yes, we are we are losing something in the, in the way of physical agglomeration benefits, but there's been enormous expansions in the scope for virtual agglomeration in virtual space, yes. which is, you said that in a better way. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to borrow, I'm going to, ne next time you hear a version of this talk, you'll. <laughs> it's actually, the, we shouldn't think of the, of the streetcar and the freeway as letting us move out. Those are the things that let us come back together again. Uh, While well, we were also living in big suburban homes with, and so on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, also it's, there's, there's a, there were, there, there's been a breakdown in in norms and and practices and habits that really didn't serve a lot of productive purpose, but we adhere to them. So this, we're, we're you're streaming this now. It's going to go on YouTube, so the whole world now can get the benefits of all the great comments you guys have made, not just the you know the 20 or so people who were in the room or there's some more who are listening uh, online. So that's, you know, why didn't we do this before? The technology was there. I, I go to lots of conferences now where that used to be closed to Chatham House rules. Now they're either live streamed or they're put on YouTube afterwards. John just co-organized an outstanding conference, conference on academic freedom, which, uh, which, which I'm happy to see has been put on YouTube. I've, I've listened to the whole thing now, John. Thank you, thank you for, to you and your co-organizers for that. Um, so, the, we just busted a bunch of norms that I think were counterproductive to the, to the dissemination of ideas. Uh, and then the last point there is if you talk to managers you will, uh, on a regular basis, Nick does a ton of this, I do a fair amount, they are still very much in a phase of struggling to adapt to the change in working arrangements. And I don't think we, I think, they're, they're going to get. They're going to adapt over time, and they're going to get a little bit better at this. So, um, uh, I've got more to say. I can, there's some evidence I can point to, but I'm going to stop there unless they're. I'm again. I don't know if anybody wants to push back on this thesis. John gave me some additional ammunition, but if somebody wants to push back, please do. You have more evidence on four. That was very interesting. I thought the the norms. I, I can give you lots of evidence. Um, the Brookings papers on economic activity. Pretty important for them. Uh, it used to be Chatham House rules. Only you know there'd be 150 people in the room, and that would be it. Oh, you mean? Yeah, I'll give you some evidence. So I'll give you two, two. Yeah, I'll give you two and a half pieces, two, two or three pieces of evidence. Scientific publications. For decades, the uh, two things have happened. Uh, the size of of uh, collaboration teams has grown, yeah. and so has the 
the geographic dispersal of those. There's a nice paper uh, by Frey, Presidente, and who, it, yeah. who's the other one? Yeah, it's, it's Frey and President. There's another, there's a third author. They, they, here's what they've done. They've gone, to, they've got like, uh, you know, the corpus of scientific uh, engineering type publications in, in over the past several decades. And they show that there's been, they show two things. Um, the, the geographic dispersal of co-authors has been increasing over time. Okay. The more interesting thing is if you go back before 2010, there was a quality discount on articles that were co-authored by geographically dispersed teams. That quality disc, and this is you know measured by citations, that quality discount was shrinking for decades. Around 2010, it vanishes and then became a premium. No, I meant this, uh, these customs and practices. Oh, okay. well, I I think of co-authorship as kind of partly a custom and practice, but but I, I don't I don't have any other than the conferences I go to. I don't have a, solid evidence on that. But this the, the, the one the, anecdote I I interviewed Marissa Mayer. If you remember cancelled work from home at Yahoo. I went back to interview and it was really interesting. It was kind of related to this point. She said when she took over Yahoo, she was the CEO from 2012 to 2016. They had no performance management practices. And she discovered all these people that were working from home, but there was no way to evaluate what they were doing. And she said she was like really frustrated. And she eventually asked to put, pull in the login details for their laptops and some of them turned them on for like over a week. And then they totally weren't working. She basically said, it was like org econ. She said, you can either evaluate inputs, which is seeing whether people are sitting at their desks working away. She said, it isn't great, but it's workable in the office. It's like a four out of 10. We can evaluate outputs, which is what they achieve. And when people in the office, you have an input as a back fallback, but the outputs may be eight out of 10 and inputs is four out of 10. When you go to fully remote, there is no input evaluation. So if you're used to input evaluation, it's just a complete disaster. And she, many firms have said, now we have, working from we have to have output based evaluation because we can't watch what people are doing it's kind of like ken's thing of you know the assistant is actually i noticed in stanford if you have an assistant who you've never asked for feedback on there is no output evaluation so I'm like how are these people evaluating yeah yeah so it, it, there's <laughs> been a big move in companies to collect more data more 360 reviews more performance feedback yeah. more data and then once you have that that works really well with remote work but without that how do you evaluate for that for us as academics, we have publications and citation. I mean, in the long run, it's very effective in the short run. There, there must also be a, not just within the business, but across businesses. There used to be an expectation, Monday through Friday, nine to five, if I want to find you, I can find you in my office. And a lot of businesses sales. So how do I make a sales call? Well, 9.05 Monday morning, you're there. Right. And we kind of have to all agree that we're either going to be in the office or all understand that we're not in the office. One alone can't really do it. In a, in a network, well, finance is certainly that way and, and lots of other businesses where my business is mostly about talking to people in other businesses and, and the expectations of where they are. Well, obviously, I, I, the Stanford University has a, you know, the, the university has 2,000 faculty and 12,000 staff. I actually worked with a lot of them. <laughs> they haven't been amazed, I don't know if you, but there's well, way more yeah, staff. I've, so this faculty, they have no control over what they do, but the staff, they totally do. So the staff here are going, it's funny you mentioned who, they're going to 3-2 with anchor days. It's a standard thing. So like yeah. a lot of investors, I've been working a bit with Lazard. So Lazard's like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the office. Everyone has to be in a Monday, Friday at home or Zoom. Zoom are going to Tuesday, Thursday in the office, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at home. And it's just coordination. But yeah, it's really problematic. Okay. Okay. Yeah. One last slide, last slide. <clears throat> um, I, you're probably all aware at this point um, that, we, that there's been a big, in, big surge in business startups. Um, as here as measured by you know newly filed new new applications for um, employer identification numbers um, and not all of these end up being uh, employer businesses but many of them do uh, the, the 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 surge is there for those that are likely to become employer businesses not what I what I want to point out here is that this this phenomenon is also related uh, in considerable measure to the shift to remote work and I want to explain why uh, so there, there's, I think, three things happening. First, there, the first is kind of maybe the most obvious. There was a, there's been a spatial reallocation of retail, restaurants, personal services, et cetera, as people don't commute downtown, they're now out in the suburbs. Um, the other two are probably more important, certainly in the long run. Uh, online, the, 
the world's become more online. The commercial world's become more online. Online businesses are easier and cheaper to start. Okay, you can you don't run afoul of zoning regulations, permitting requirements. You can often start them out of your home. They don't require much capital. So that is a source of dynamism, extra dynamism in the economy that is likely to continue well beyond the transition response to the spatial reallocation point. And then third point, which is related to the second, but not exactly the same, it's become much easier to source labor inputs remotely. That also facilitates startups at small scale or startups that are in remote locations. So this, the, the thing I wanna stress here is the second and third points are going to persist for a long time and lead me to think that we're going to have a persistently higher rate of new business formation uh, for many years to come. Uh, which is probably a good thing for the economy. There's a lot of good things that come out of uh, having uh, high business formation rates. I'm going to stop there. You have the same curve for deregistrations? Uh, I don't. My my, I think there's much less of a of a trend in de de deregulation. There was, I think there was deregulations in the immediate wake of the pandemic, but I don't think you see any big. A dramatic regime shift the way you no, do here. Lots of restaurants closed. Yeah, yeah. but that yeah. was a tr that was the transition phenomenon. I, I don't think you see a well. I shouldn't. <coughs> there's going to be a shakeout of all these new guys, but but there should be a persistence because just as they have lower entry costs, there will be more people just crossing the boundary. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Say, oh no, it's no good. I'll, you're I'll right. Um, but again, I, that's by and large a, a good thing in my view. It's become cheaper to experiment become cheaper to experiment commercially, and some of these experiments will pan out, and some won't. But if experimentation is easy and cheap, then yeah. we should do a lot of so, it. That looks like what's happening. So we're out of time. We're out of time. Th thank, thank you, you so everybody. Much.